Yoni Alzam was only 22 years old, but he was already active in the most feared Israeli mafia operating in the country, also in Europe and America, the Abergio crime family. Unfortunately, his future wasn't looking too bright. He had just been convicted of the murder of another gangland figure in 2003, a crime boss that was allied with Zev Rosenstein, the main rival of his bosses. Alzam was staring down a life sentence, and he made the unfortunate decision to turn state's witness against one of the Abergeel associates for the same murder he had already been convicted of. The Abergeels weren't exactly lightweights. They weren't scared to kill witnesses, and Israeli mafia figures have a long history of targeting anyone who got in their way. Police, mayors, judges, prosecutors, it didn't matter. Alzam, though, was set to testify not only against the associate, but against high-up figures in the Abergeel family, including some of the four brothers who ran it. It was December of 2005, and figures in the Israeli underworld had been fighting a costly war that shocked the country. Bodies were dropping all over as rival families made and broke alliances, trying to gain control of various gambling, extortion, drug, and waste management rackets. The families were no joke, and punched well above their weight. They controlled the global ecstasy trade, were active on five continents, and killed people all over the world, sometimes using high-tech car bombs. One had even aligned with the Latino street gang in Los Angeles to take on La M.A., the Mexican mafia. It's like something out of a Grand Theft Auto plotline, and law enforcement couldn't really do anything about it at the moment. The rival families were vicious, but they were also sophisticated and smart, especially the Abergeels, led by Yitzhak, AKA Big Friend, which is just like a really solid mafia nickname. Possibly one of the greatest criminal prodigies to ever operate. They had slid under the radar for a bit, but a 2003 bombing in December outside a money change booth in the cosmopolitan city of Tel Aviv that killed three civilians, but failed to take out Zev Rosenstein, the other top mafioso in the country, made for a lot of pissed off news reports and pissed off statements from politicians, as the government decided it was time to do something about all the mafia guys just running wild. Rosenstein actually survived the bombing, earning him the name the Wolf with the Seven Lives. Zev actually means wolf in, in Hebrew. For all the assassination attempts against him that failed. Alzam's testimony was going to help strike a major blow against the Abergeels. He was set to testify in a few hours when he started coughing and wheezing in his cell. Something was clearly wrong, and he was taken to a hospital nearby. Right before midnight on the same day, he was pronounced dead. Cyanide was eventually found to be the culprit, and somehow, despite being isolated in a maximum security prison, he had been poisoned. It was a clear message from the Israeli Mafia dons. They were the ones in control. Boom! Cold open. That's how we're doing it. Welcome to another episode of the Underworld Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Gold. Sean is sitting this one out, and I'm joined here by Ben Hartman, who has covered organized crime in Israel for years to tell the story of the Israeli mafia wars of the last few decades. And let me tell you, these Israeli mafia guys are wild. So welcome, Ben. Um, I know you covered this for a few years. Tell us a bit about it and kind of what you're doing now. So these days I, I write about uh, cannabis for a living, full-time marijuana reporter, I guess you'd put it, cannabis research, uh, science, uh, legislation, and culture for a website called Kenigma.com. And uh, we also have a podcast, the Cannabis Enigma podcast. But uh, prior to doing this, um, the world of cannabis, which is a little bit of a nicer world, I covered organized crime and crime in general at the Jerusalem Post for about about seven years. And then before that, I was a report, I was a editor and reporter at Hearts.com in English for about three years. The, the Israeli world of crime, prior to me being a journalist or being a reporter and covering it, was always pretty fascinating. Um, you know, in the same way, obviously, that, that you're interested in organized crime and the people who listen to this are and, and watch movies about crime are. But it's also um, beyond all that kind of lurid aspect of it. I think it, organized crime in Israel, it, the story of it here and how it plays out, it says a, a tremendous amount about this country and uh, the story of the country and how these people got into that life and how we got where we are. So I'm sure we'll get uh, more into that, but uh, it's great to be on here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming, man. Thanks for doing this. I mean, half of the research I used, I think, was was written by you, so it made sense to have you come on. Yeah, and, uh, good call. Yeah, we're going to talk a, a bit about the luridness, too, because that, to me, I mean, the level of sophistication, the car bombs, the viciousness, the global reach, the insane rivalries, and the just absurd characters involved, like, mm -hmm. it, it kind of puts the New York Mafia Wars of the 80s to shame. Like, the more research I did the more shocked I was. It's funny about that in, in Israel with organized crime, because on the one hand, Israel as a country 
with with crime and violence and, and murder and all that, it, it's nowhere near um, places in the states. Certainly not, for instance, your your episode about St. Louis. I mean, there's there's no comparison in terms of the public safety and the murder rate and the gun violence, certainly. But at the same time, um, the methods that you see with organized crime here, you often don't see in the states. You know, guys using shoulder fired missiles and remote controlled bombs and stuff like that. You don't you, you're not going to see that in St. Louis or in other places in America that have other crime problems that you don't have here. So it's this kind of strange sort of dichotomy you have here with uh, Israeli organized crime and Israeli, you know, low lives in general. Yeah, it's it's something else. I mean, the story is we're going to tell some of these stories. We're going to get into the various families and the wars that have been fought. Uh, and like I said, we're using a lot of Ben's work here, but there's been some great work in the Times of Israel in Tablet from Asaf Gore and Douglas Century uh, and a few others. And th- this is going to be a great episode because I think both both Jews and anti-Semites are going to love it, you know? Let, let me get this out of the way real quick, too. Like, we're, we're not here to really talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You're in the wrong place. That's kind of not what we do. And, and I, I just, you know, I, I reported in Israel during the Gaza war and, and stuff in 2014, 2015. Everyone's going to hate you no matter what you do. So I think it's best just not to care. But if you want to be angry about that, go ahead. But we're just we're just not really gonna gonna talk about it. Definitely, I would say for anybody who is so inclined, who, who does care about about the conflict, um, perhaps something optimistic here: the the world of crime in Israel and Palestine is one of the one of the places where you see the best cooperation and coexistence between Jews and Arabs. Uh, there there is obviously you know they feud from time to time, but you know and there's beef and there's bloodshed and whatnot. But crime and the pursuit of money uh, th- that's somewhere where where Jews and Arabs can definitely work together and live together. So through organized crime, um, we're working on coexistence. So there you go. And it's also, you know, and it's not because, you know, these guys don't care about religion or anything like that. A lot of these guys are, um, you know, they may be right wing, they may be in, involved in, in, you know, they may be religious and all that, but it's just not something that's going to um, get in the way of their business. It's just, it's a beautiful thing when, when a, a Jewish guy and an Arab can unite and kill their enemies over controlling uh, recycling bins, you know, like it's, it's what we really hope to see in the future of the world is people like that uniting, uh, over their differences, maybe not murdering people over, over bottle recycling, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And and if you can can do it while helping the environment, I think that's, that's also, uh, that's also, yeah, why not? Um, little side note too, there's been a lot of talks about the Russian oligarch mafiosos that have moved through Israel. We actually talked about it a bit in the Brighton beach episode. When the Soviet Union fell and Russia opened up, you had a lot of these Russian mafiosos, some Jewish, some kind of faking it, who would later try to get a foothold in Israel and use it as a, as a you know, big place to transfer and launder money. They mixed in some human trafficking, but for the most part, they didn't get too involved in Israel itself. Apparently, according to Misha Glenny's McMafia, a fantastic book we've mentioned a number of times, they also struck a deal to not let things get messy in Israel. Hmm. I think it's um, one of the funny things writing about organized crime in Israel over the years, I would say when it, whenever I talk to an American reader and that that's what I do or that's what I write about, I, probably nine times out of 10, the first thing they would say was, oh, is it the Russians? The, 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 the assumption was that it's, you know, there's mafia in Israel, it must be the Russians. And that was always a really curious thing to me because they're not the ones who run it. They're not the ones who are in charge of that. And I think if somebody, you know, if somebody hears organized crime and they don't, you know, they assume it must not be the Jews uh, here who's doing it, then I think it just, you know, it says more about them than, than the country. It says, um, well, it says you, you must be new here. You know, you must not have been here for long if you think it's not, uh, if it's not our guys doing this. Right. We're going to talk about what I guess you would call the, the homegrown Israeli mafias. And they definitely had no such sort of peace deal going on. In a WikiLeaks cable from May, 2009, the U S ambassador to Israel wrote a message titled Israel, the promised land of organized crime. And this is a quote. Five or six families have traditionally controlled organized crime in Israel. The Abrajil, the Abutbol, the Alperon, and Rosenstein families are among the best known, but recent arrests and assassinations have created a vacuum at the top. And I believe that newcomers like Molnar, Shirazi, Cohen, and Domrani are closing the gap. So there's five or six of the main families in Israel just mentioned here, and they're definitely not like the five families of La Cosa Nostra, who, you know, at times had these sort of unity things and peace deals. In true Israeli family fashion, they all fight with each other, they all make alliances, they all fight their allies, and it's, it's a bit hard to keep track, but I think we're going to start with the Alperones, if only because of their reality show, which sounds e- either made up or like it was on Quibi, R.I.P. Quibi, you were too pure for this world. Yeah, it was, um, it was 
a few years back, it was a while ago, obviously he's been dead for 12 years, but it was called Pam uh, B'chaim, which in Hebrew is uh, once, once in life or once in a life. Um, and it was one of these sorts of shows where you'd have different celebrities, a different celebrity personality meeting with other different celebrities. So there, there was a model living with them at their home in Ranana, which is a very um, kind of like nerdy, perfect little Israeli middle-class suburb where kind of like dads who work in high tech live and, you know, it's a very nice place to grow up. So it's, it's not the type of place they usually associate with organized crime. And, uh, but that, that just kind of speaks to how much of a household name he was in Israel. And today also, if we could give her a, a shout out here, his, his widow, Ahuva Alperon is something of a Instagram influencer these days. She does a lot of like cooking stuff on, uh, she's, she's pretty well known. So if you want to check it out, a lot of uh, desserts and uh, foods, kind of like, you know, Mor- Moroccan style cooking, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of baked goods. So check out Ahuva Alperon on Instagram. Why not? <laughs> She's we been, get she's been plug, through right? a lot. She's been through a lot. She's not responsible for the things her husband did, if, even if she may have benefited from it, you know. Let's get her, let's get her to at the episode, you know. Let's get her to get her, get her, uh, do some Patreon stuff. By the way, uh, there's so much here that I think for the first time, we're actually going to do a special Patreon episode uh, with some of the other gangsters that we're not going to have time to sort of mix into these four main families that we're talking about. But yeah, the, the TV show, Alperone, like it wasn't, you know, America had growing up Gotti. But it wasn't like that because Alperon was still an active mafioso while the show was going on. Yeah. And the model, the model has this quote, uh, you know, from afterwards where she says, quote, you see the Sopranos and it sounds sexy that some mafioso comes and charms you into the sunset. But in reality, it is the opposite. It is very intimidating, scary, not kosher. She said that to Yidiot Akhwano, one of the local Israeli publications. Right. Well, I would say that most, uh, you know, people who are in Israeli organized crime I would say most of them probably do keep kosher, but but um, but, but beyond that, <laughs> no, they do. It's the type of these guys, you know, they very often, more often than not, come from pretty traditional backgrounds. So, you know, they might kill you, but they're not going to mix milk and meat. But I would say, even though these guys tend tend to be charming and have you know strong personalities in that way, like guys and who, who are criminals very often do, uh, as part of the psychology of that personality. I think what she said does hit on a point here. Um, you know, the, the Sicilian mob and other mobs in, in the U.S. also aren't, you know, actually glamorous. But with the Israeli mob, it's definitely true. Uh, they don't have the same formalities and rituals and getting made in a ceremony with a, a sword and a dove and all that type of stuff you've seen in movies. They also, their their aesthetic is much more, um, you know, Hugo Boss t-shirts and Lacoste and bad sneakers. So it's not a lot of, you know, <laughs> three-piece suits and, and, and you know, $1,000 shoes and whatnot. It's a lot more informal, and a lot of these guys kind of look like like scrubs, and you wouldn't maybe what you would picture like a a mafioso maybe coming from the from the states. Let's say that doesn't mean they yeah, won't I mean, they won't kill you all the same. That they're not sophisticated. They're very sophisticated. A lot of these dudes, but you know the uh, like Israelis in general with the informality. A lot of you know Israelis aren't going to put on a suit if it's not at their bar mitzvah. So you know don't don't let that <laughs> fool you. You know. I was going to say, you go boss t-shirts and bad sneakers sounds like most Israelis I know. No disrespect. Um, but yeah, look. Al Perone, he, yeah, he, he had already developed a rep for being super accessible to the press and hence the TV show. They actually called him Israel's Tony Soprano. So Yaakov Al Perone is, is the boss, was the boss. He was born in a suburb of Tel Aviv in 1955 to parents who immigrated from Egypt. And this is actually something you'll see a lot of with Israeli mafiosos that they're of North African descent. After 1948, when Israel was created, you had an exodus of Jews in countries from countries like Morocco, Egypt, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, who were sort of forced to flee their homelands. Uh, Israel was generally a very poor country, but these Jews were among the most marginalized and downtrodden in the country after they came. So they're a bit overrepresented in the crime families because, as we've covered routinely in the past, poverty and marginalization lead to crime. Israel had this post-1960s development boom and people like Yaakov Alperon, they were left in the dark. Yeah, so I think that's one of the, I mentioned earlier about when looking at crime, it kind of tells the story of the country. And I think that's certainly the case in Israel. It looks a lot, as you mentioned, it, it, it hits upon the, the racial and ethnic divisions in the country, how the country was founded in those years afterwards and the ways of immigration and what happened and where those people were put and where they were put to live and the types of jobs and opportunities that were open to them. And it's kind of, Organized crime in Israel, the story of it and the history of it kind of hits upon the question of, in Israel, you know, 
who gets a seat at the table and who, and who needs to kick the door in and grab a seat or just burn the house down. So that's when you look at a lot of these type of guys and the stories and how they came up. Um, they were, they were in tough spots and a lot of these guys were going to do what they had to, to eat. It's also the fact that with those communities, a lot of those guys came from, especially back then, but also now to a certain extent, um, and especially in Arab communities with Arab crime, a lot of this has to do with places where the state is not at its most functional, you know, neighborhoods that are neglected, where the municipal authorities, where the social services, where if somebody gets shot, are the cops going to come? And if they do come, are they going to either be, you know, under policing or over policing? And so organized crime in Israel and the type of guys who have typically been at the forefront of it and also in the you know, rank and file, um, their ethnic background and the stories of their families and also the stories of their communities and how crime was able to flourish in them, it, it has a great deal to do with the, the story of this country as a whole. And I think that's something you see a lot in, in criminal groups that, that rise up, right, is a lot of them tend to do so in places where the state is not exactly uh, at, their, at their most potent or, or at their most involved. Uh, it's something we saw in immigrant communities in, in the U.S., right? The Italians, the Eastern European Jews at the time, uh, even in the 80s and 90s, the Russians, the China, we, we talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, you know, it's not just the Israel that happens. It happens all over the world. That's a pretty, pretty well-worn phenomenon. Yeah, and where, there's, and where there's a vacuum with the state, it's going to get filled by, by organized crime. And if you have, you know, if somebody gets shot in broad daylight in the middle of central Tel Aviv, it's going to be a big story. If they get shot in broad daylight in the middle of Jal Julia, mm -hmm. It's probably not. So this, all these dynamics add up and, and help create this situation. According to the LA Times, this is a quote from an article they wrote too, organized crime blossomed here in the 1980s and 1990s while security forces were focused on Palestinian terrorist threats. By the time Israeli authorities truly began to grapple with the problem a few years ago, they faced a sophisticated global network of gambling, prostitution, and drug trafficking, with Los Angeles as one of its hubs. There was an assassination in Encino, alliances with violent LA gangs, and the establishment of an Israeli-directed drug pipeline from Europe straight to Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Al Perone and his brothers started off, they were boxers, and they soon started demanding protection money, extorting people, that whole sort of, you know, commonplace origin story. Soon they were fighting for control of gambling rackets, extortion rackets, everything from sidewalk flower vendors to bottle recycling. All sorts of rackets. There's rackets all over the place. And the bottling recycling one is, is interesting. Israel was actually a, a pretty socialist country and started to privatize in recent decades. And much like the sort of Russian oligarch grab in the 80s and 90s, once Israel started privatizing things like, like the bottle recycling stuff, you know, the kind of powerful bully types were the ones who took over. Arye Alperon, who was one of Yaakov's brothers, he sees the government privatizing the bottle recycling, so he forms a company called the Flaming Bottle. And this is in the late 1990s. And of course, you know, he's not going to play nice with the competition. So he basically uses extortion and that sort of bullying method. Bullying sounds like such a, such a weak word for this. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. he, he fucking barges in there and he takes over. Yeah, and now the other mob bosses, very not cool. they see this. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely, definitely, there should have been, like, he wasn't just yelling at people on Twitter. You know what I'm saying? Like he was going in there and, and he, he, was, he was just mean about it, you know? Right. And uh, the other mob bosses see this, they see the easy money. And that's when one of the Israeli crime wars kick off. And I, I just, I love the waste management aspect of organized crime, like the simplest industries just being mobbed up, not even controlling unions, literally controlling like recycled aluminum cans becomes this mafioso business that's fought over. Yeah, look, it's, I mean, it's, it sounds funny when you, when you picture it just as like recycling, but there's, there's a ton of money in it. And also it's, um, organized crime is well situated to do that because, you know, you can deploy a whole lot of guys to go around to a whole lot of restaurants and other types of places, and they will give them their bottles quite quickly, you know? And so you're going to have guys who are able to collect those quite, uh, quite effectively. I think the bottle thing on a personal level, it, it's funny. Obviously when you read about it, to me it was always kind of ironic or a little bit funny because not to generalize, but I will, Israelis tend to be, um, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's kind of a problem with littering here. If you ever been to a park in Israel after a holiday uh, when people are barbecuing and all that, I mean, it's trash. So really, for the most part, the only people who are really taking recycling seriously in Israel is, is organized crime. And, and for, for good reason. So back in 2007, they were working to pass a law to change the bottle deposit, um, return to where it would also apply to the big, 
big bottles of Coke, the 1.5 liter soft drinks. And it, this was to help poor families who drink a lot of Coke and all that. A lot of people called it the Alperone Law as a nickname um, because obviously they were the ones to profit in a huge way. Um, but regardless, you know, even if they're looking out for their own interests, I think um, we definitely got to give it up for the Israeli, uh, the Israeli underworld for being the, arguably the country's greatest environmentalist, even if only in one very specific way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a funny story. It's definitely, it's always Earth Day with the, uh, with the Alperones. Every day is Earth Day, you know? I mean, these guys, these guys are woke, you know, they're, they're uniting with, with Arab families. They're caring about the environment. Like they are for, you know, they, they just really, they're progressive. Yeah. I, ahead I of their time, say. ahead of their time. Yeah. Jacob Alperon had very little online clout though. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't really on, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, the, he wasn't there yet. No. Uh, so they fought this bottle recycling war. All these wars start kicking off in the late nineties and two thousands. And it seems as if every family at one time or another was fighting a war with every other family. The Alperones were originally aligned with the Abergils. They fought with the Rosenstein family and the Abu Bulls and Amir Molnar, who we'll talk about soon. Though soon enough, their alignment with Abergils turned sour. And I know this sounds like a lot, and that's because it really, really is. But we're going to get into to all of it as much as we can. All you need to know right now is that the Alperones had a habit of escaping assassination attempts. That's the other thing too. Like so many of these guys escaped multiple attempts on them. Seven, five, nine, not just the Alperones, but all the other bosses too. By some reports, Yaakov had escaped three. Others had it at nine, but I think, Ben, you said that was his brother who escaped nine attempts? Right, so it was Nisim Alperon was pretty famous for that. He survived nine attempts, if not more. Uh, two of these I covered, I was, I was at the scene, obviously afterwards, not involved in the uh, planning. <laughs> not involved in the planning, Nisim, if you're out there. Um, one of them was a bomb that blew up on his car in his car on uh, Menachem Begin, in one of the main streets in Tel Aviv, and the other, very close to the courthouse. Uh, the other was a bomb in his Jeep in Ramat Gan on Rashi Street. And um, he, he's one of those mob guys who, whatever his actual status in the underworld was, or how big he was or not, um, he definitely photographed well and was on TV a lot because he, partly he had a voice like one of those dudes who has their larynx taken out and just speaks through a voice box, just like, ah, da, da, you know, very, like you never forget this dude's voice. And he also looked, he very much looked the part of a middle-aged Israeli guy who may or may not do extortion work. He also, <laughs> um, their family really likes horses. That's a thing that's well known about them. Um, he made actually the international press because he was in the, the Daily Beast, a, a colleague, a friend of mine, Neri Zilber, wrote about him because he, some dudes in the West Banks and Palestinians stole one of his horses, a horse named Tony. I'm assuming that's, after Tony Soprano, not Tony Bennett, but I can't confirm. Tony Tony loved horses too. Everyone knows. Yeah, he definitely did. So so basically, it got stolen, taken to the West Bank. He made some phone calls, or whatever, and made some connections, and they were able to go out there in the middle of the night and get the horse back, uh, which was a bizarre story. But it's also again, it's that cooperation, and you know these guys are they're looking out for their bottom line and and making money and helping each other out, and also um, that's kind of a cliche thing to a certain extent, like you know you get your car stolen, you can make a few phone calls and somebody can find where it is. In this case, it was a, it was a horse. It was Tony. Yeah. <laughs> one story goes that there was a hit team after one of the Alperon family members at one point, but they ended up getting into a shootout with police because they were under surveillance. And I'm actually not sure if the shootout happened because the AP has a similar story about a 2004 hit that was supposedly targeting the Alperones that, with these hitmen who had been flown in from Belarus. And this is a quote, in the biggest catch, detectives last month arrested four men from Belarus and 14 Israelis on suspicions they tried to kill several mob bosses. In the apartment of the suspected hitman in a Tel Aviv suburb, officers found pistols, silencers, assault rifles, anti-tank missiles, explosives, night vision equipment, and hand grenades. They also seized disguises and makeup. Yeah, that's what, well, I mean, obviously that's, that's a bit, um, that all seems like a lot of hearsay, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, definitely that would that would seem to implicate them. I one of the really strange things about about that case, um, for those who are outside of the the genre, one of the guys who was also being targeted was a man named uh, Shoni Gavrieli, who was known as an organized crime figure um, in Israel. His brother was involved in casinos in Turkey. More more notably, Shoni was the father of a woman named Inbal Inbal Gavrieli, uh, who served in uh, in the Knesset, in the Israeli Parliament, on the Likud list. It was a, one of those kind of strange stories where um, she was the last person on the list, and it's always, you know, the last person just somehow gets in. 
Um, she magically made it onto the list in the Likud primaries because of uh, family connections, as it was described at the time. Um, there was a good case a few years, a while after that, where she used her parliamentary immunity to stop police from uh, searching her, her uh, from doing a search warrant on her dad. But like Ehuva Alperon, in some extent, she also was on Israeli Survivor. She was also on the Israeli version of Kitchen Nightmares. She was also on uh, another reality show. Basically, there's if you know Israel, there's they're very into reality TV shows. There's also it's a small country, and there's only about twenty actors, and each one of them is about is on about six different shows at one time, like all the same actors. So, so she, like with reality stars, in Bal Gavrieli, this kind of um, alleged you know organized crime uh, child heiress. Um, became a parliamentary and then a reality TV star. But her, you know, where that they got a little bit famous with some of the wider public was after that hit or that attempted hit with the Belarus guys. Yeah, we definitely have that in the U.S. too. I want to make fun of it, but we definitely have, I think there was like a Married to the Mob TV show and Growing Up Gotti and all that. So I guess it's uh, it's uniform. People people love these stories. I mean, I watched Growing Up why, Gotti. I, I watched it. Yeah. And I liked it. Yeah. There, there was haircuts. Who could forget? I mean, I went to high school with kids like that. But uh <laughs> Yeah, that people love these stories, which is why we're doing this and why you should pay us to keep doing this. Patreon.com slash the Underworld Podcast. We're going to have a bonus episode on all this stuff, so, so jump on there. Moving on, November of 2008, Opron's luck runs out. He's killed in a car bombing after leaving a courthouse where one of his sons was on trial for extortion and threats. He leaves behind seven kids, and at his massive funeral, one of them is quoted as saying, I will send back that person to God. He won't have a grave because I'll cut off his hands, head, and body. It's really like a family affair with, with Israeli crime families, as, as we'll see. Yeah, it's very heartwarming. Um, I, was, I remember the day he was killed because I was, I was at work, and it was one of those types of things. When, whenever there's a bomb or an explosion uh, like that in Israel, the, the way they always like, describe it in, in Hebrew, is it like, is it, um, is it nationalist or criminal? So is it nationalist? That means that it's a terror attack. If it's criminal, obviously, it's, it's mobsters blowing each other up. So typically when it's in a you know, specific car, and the driver's side seat is blown up by a bomb placed there. Obviously, you know, it's not a terror attack. Um, obviously, it became very clear who, you know, very quickly that it was Al Peron. You know, it's in the, and it's, again, in the middle of Tel Aviv, one of the busiest junctions in the whole city on Namir, Namir Boulevard. And he's right there. And I remember it, it was quite grisly. Like, there, was, there were pictures sent in um, by the photographers from the scene. And it's like, um, yeah, about as, about as grisly as you'd imagine, a guy getting blown up in his car. Not, not the way you want to you go. No, no, not at all. Closed casket. Uh, The question is who killed him? And of course, because of all these wars, there's a laundry list of suspects. In fact, one day after he's killed, two members of the Abergil family are sentenced to prison for conspiring to kill a different brother, Nisim, who we talked about just a minute ago, because obviously the Alperones have a few with the Abergils over many things, but also because a member of the Abergil family was beaten by the Alperones under under a security camera at a busy intersection. So that was that was one of the weirder ones. Um, I always thought that was a weird story because it was where, where the spot it took place is right next to the the diamond uh, the diamond exchange in Ramat Gan, one of the larger diamond exchanges in it, in, in the world, and it's a it's a giant tower called the Migdal Moshe Aviv, which was the tallest in Israel at the time. I think it may still be. It's a very phallic giant building, and a lot of um, you know, it's got luxury apartments in there, and so some some mob types live there, and Abarjal was living there at the time, and they they were having some they were supposed to have some sort of talk outside and. Somebody exchanged words, and then they just ran up on on Itzik Abadjil and just started hitting him. And it was Arye Alperon apparently was beating him up. Who, if anybody at home could could look up a photo of Arye Alperon, at least in his prime, he very much looked like a, a, um, I would say the most goonish of the brothers. Like he just he had that face um, of a guy who who does that line of work, or let's say dresses for that job, and and definitely like he, you know, you can see how. Um, some kind of thing like a hot-headed instance who said something y'all are talking shit or whatnot and then next thing you know you gotta you know bombs and whatnot another main suspect is this crime boss amir molnar who happens to be an explosive expert and when i say he's an explosive expert i literally mean he was trained by the israeli army as an explosive expert in the golani brigade which is sort of you know this respected infantry brigade molnar was also the son of a police officer he came up in, in like a streaking of sorts and fought a blood war against others in the 90s. In the early 2000s, a member of his gang decides to become an informant and fearing arrest, Molnar flees overseas, which is something that seems to happen a lot with Israeli organized crime figures. They just kind of like dip out to South America, to Morocco. They're all over the place. And 
I mean, the Israeli police, Ben, you can tell us more. They seem kind of incompetent when it comes to, to stopping these guys sometimes, both because their criminal justice system is weak and because these guys are, are smart. And it's kind of reminiscent to me of European police, say in like Sweden, who are basically useless, for lack of a better word, when it comes to stopping organized crime and have a super lax system that always has these guys going in and out like a revolving door. Yeah, well, I think when you, when you look at the Israeli, uh, Israeli law enforcement, um, it's always been far down the ladder in terms of prestige and respect and funding. So you have, you know, obviously in Israel, all the prestige and whatnot is in the security services. So there's, there's Mossad, Shin Bet, the IDF, the, you know, the Air Force, everything. And then somewhere down that list, you have the police. And then at the bottom, you have the prison service. So they're already kind of not a lot of prestige and a lot of um, respect put there. And a lot of the guys also come from the same neighborhoods as a lot of the guys they're fighting or they're going after. Um, and while there is, um, there is a great deal of professional talent in, in the Israeli police, especially when you get to those high-level investigative units like in the, the you know, the Yamar, the Akhbar, uh, Laha 433 and that whatnot, they have a lot of very talented guys and, and very advanced technological means at their disposal. And the same stuff like the inter interior security services use and whatnot uh, to fight terror. So they have, they have a lot of good guys, but there's also a lot of not good. <laughs> and um, it's, it's not a, a corrupt police force like in a lot of other countries on that level, but there is... Um, a lot of problems with, with um, the professionalism, the ability to close cases, a lot of issues with, with sexual harassment over the years, but also with, with organized crime. They've arrested a lot of guys, but arresting them and getting convictions is, is a lot different. And also there's been a big uh, reliance on, on state witnesses, which, which can be very effective uh, when you get informants like that and cut deals with them. But it's also, it, I always think it kind of indicates the fact that you don't have a lot of real kind of like street level and intel and people on the inside and people who really understand and are tracking these organizations if what you're trying to do is basically trying to flip guys and get cases that way. So, and when it comes to them being overseas, I think that the ability to stop Israeli guys overseas, you know, first and foremost goes to the local cops, but it's also what their relationships are like with their Israeli counterparts. So the, the Israelis know some guys are looking for in the States. They have real good connections with the, their counterparts in, in the U.S., they even have some uh, some of those guys uh, stationed here permanently, like from the FBI. And if and if that come if that country in question has good ties with the Israeli authorities and has a good police force, then that makes a big difference. But a lot of these countries that they operate in have their own problems with crime that are much bigger than ours, and have their own problems with their police force. Um, places in Eastern Europe, South Africa, places like that, Mexico, where a lot of guys go. So in places like that, you can kind of, um, you can dip into the scene and, and uh, start a new life. Speaking of state witnesses, uh, while Molnar is overseas, the witness in his case, the guy who got flipped, survives one assassination attempt. And then in June of 2004, two hitmen scale a building and kill him in his living room. So Molnar returns to the country shortly after. The murder, of course, has never been solved. A few years after he returns, Molnar and Al Barone get into it. They have a meeting at a hotel, a sit down to sort of negotiate a turf dispute. And one of the Al Barones, I think Ben points out, it's, it's the son drawer who's supposed to be a hothead, right. ends up stabbing Molnar in the, in the neck. Yeah, he ended up stabbing in the neck. Yeah. That's kind of the moment where if, if he had any intentions of not following the same line of work as his dad, the, the moment he stabbed Amir Molnar in the neck, now you got to kind of, that's kind of, now you've chosen that profession. I don't think, you know, you're not going to go to a startup, you know? You're, you're now in this life. Yeah, I'm, I'm no mafia expert either, but you got to imagine Molnar wasn't fond of that incident and wanted some revenge. Yeah. Anyway, a year later, Molnar goes on to become sort of a media darling doing, due to being a bit of a, a, just a wild guy. In 2013, a lawyer working a case against him, his car explodes, which is kind of standard procedure for Israeli mafia guys. But Molnar decides to represent himself in court after getting arrested, I think for something else. And he gives up his right to an attorney. And apparently he just kills it. I mean, he washes the prosecutors. He interrogates the hell out of the police officers taking the stand. And he wins the case. And in another story, another incident, Molnar's arrested and during the interrogation, like in, in that room, he takes his schwanz out and just pees against the wall right in front of the detectives. 
Uh, he claims they didn't allow him a bathroom break and had no choice. And of course, he gets released on whatever charge that was as well. I would, you know what? Honestly, I would, I would give him the benefit of the doubt on that. I find that there's a, a shortage of um, public bathrooms in Israel. You don't really find them as much <laughs> as you'd hope to. But I would also say I could see them hold them in there and not letting them go take a piss. You know, that, that's definitely possible. I think with, with, with Molnar, um, part of his like public persona was always this just quiet looking dude. Like he just a man of few words. Like he just seemed very in control of everything. That doesn't mean he always was. Um, but I think him, him more or less staying out of trouble for the most part, considering everything he's done allegedly, he's a very smart guy. He's very sophisticated. He's been doing this for a long, long time. People fear him and aren't going to, aren't going to talk about him and talk to the police. And he's always had very good attorneys. He was represented by a guy for a long time, uh, named, Moti Katz, who also represented the Rosenstein and the Moosley brothers. These guys have money and they have loyalty from the guys they're with and, and they know not to talk. They know they're not like these these new younger guys, uh, these mob heirs like Droy Operon we mentioned, who, you know, they were born into a family that was that was set up and had money. So they never had to make it on their own. Um, that older generation was is not that Amir Molder is not that old, but the generation before they whatever they got, they built their own way and they did it themselves because they had street smarts and they knew how to stay out of trouble. So, so guys like them, him do a good job at that. I share one other anecdote about Amir Molnar, which I got, I heard from one guy in the hip hop scene in Israel and another guy confirmed it at a party, but didn't want to talk about it. Apparently about a decade or something ago, Amir Molnar uh, flew Coolio to Israel to do a, 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 <laughs> a gig from the story from what I understand and, and this is what makes it very believable to me because it sounds like such a, a kind of Israeli, um, certain type of Israeli dude thing. They just really liked Gangster's Paradise. We love that song. We love it. So some of his dudes flew, apparently, allegedly flew, flew him out here to do a show. It, it was at this club, but the promoters, it was somewhat, that's what I understand. I, I can't confirm that, but, um, you know, we're, we're happy to talk about Coolio on this show too. <laughs> That's the type of power you have. If you can, that's the type of power you can get. You can get Coolio on a commercial flight, and uh, you know, all these years later, flying Coolio out in like 2010 to perform that song is just like the perfect level of Israeli cheesiness, you know? Yeah. Like you got a, you got a middle-aged Israeli cheesiness. You got to respect that. No, I think yeah. It's um, also, I mean, one of the one of the aspects of living in Israel is that you're never more than, let's say, 48 hours from hearing. This is how we do it by Montel Jordan somewhere still, <laughs> or if I got five on it by Luna. It's like you're you're still going to hear that, so it's not surprising that um, you know Coolio still has a base at least with that one hit. You know, <laughs> another potential suspect in the uh, in the murder and crime family we're going to discuss is the uh, Abu Bulls. So one of the Alperon brothers, Nassim, he's the one who was alleged to have survived the nine assassination attempts was said to have been behind the killing of the one-time patriarch of the Abut, Abut Bulls. Sorry, Abut Bulls, am I saying that right? Abut Bulls. Abut Bulls. Uh, Felix, really? who was outside one of his casinos in the Czech Republic. There's that international reach again. The Israeli mobs, they run a bunch of European casinos. And the Abrazils may have also been behind the killing as well, as the Abut Bulls were engaged in a war with the Abrazils about international gambling rackets and drug trafficking routes in the US, Europe, and Israel. Felix was one of the original Israeli godfathers. He rose up as a gambling kingpin in the coastal city of Netanya before expanding his reach into these European casinos. In the late 80s, he was apparently involved in a failed kidnapping attempt of a Nigerian minister in London. The minister was found in a wooden box supposed to be shipped internationally. Felix does six years. Regrettably, I could not find any more information on this and I'm thoroughly disappointed in myself. So that was, um, it's funny because that's actually a story that I, 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 re I wrote about in kind of a roundabout way, um, because it's it's a very strange case that, from what I've learned, is very well known in Nigeria or fairly well known, at least at least more so than in Israel. Um, back in about 2012 or 13, I was writing an article about a guy named Alex Barak, who was a childhood friend of Felix, and took part in that operation and that kidnapping, and he was arrested with Felix and did time in prison in the UK with Felix. The whole question is, why were they, who put them up to this? Why did they do it? But the reason I wrote about him was because Alex Barak, a few years, uh, some sometime after that, he was shot in an assassination attempt in Tel Aviv, paralyzed from the chest down, and then he became this uh, advocate for medical marijuana, and they named a strain of cannabis after him. So I wrote an article about him um, 
for high times back then about the uh, mystery man, organized crime, Mossad figure who uh, inspired a strain of, of cannabis. So it, the story is real. They did try to kidnap this dude and put him in a wooden box. <laughs> why they thought it would work, I don't know. And why these are the guys who, who were at the center, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, one thing about Felix, though, um, we talk a lot about how these guys are, are a bit um, not, not all that suave, in at least what we assume from mafiosos. Felix had all, had the reputation back then of of actually being being a pretty slick dude. He was part of that's the the Moroccan the French thing, and you know, and uh, but it was but it was the the suits and the just just the vibe. He was he was kind of that guy a little bit. He did he he had a kind of rare style for these sorts of Israeli dudes, and and he lived in Netanya, which is a francophone city on the seaside. So he was uh, not that everybody there is that slick, but he definitely he was one of the dudes who who did kind of have that. Um, that classiness as it were. Which makes sense. I mean, getting assassinated outside a casino in the Czech Republic, I feel like that's a classy way to die as opposed to a car bomb outside a currency exchange. Yeah. That's how I hope, you know, that's what I'm. <laughs> yeah. He gets killed in that war between the Abu Bulls and the Abergils. Two months earlier, an Abergil had been gunned down in front of his family. Meanwhile, in December of 2005, four guys are caught after conspiring to kill another Abu Bull, Asi, by firing an anti-tank missile at his house. Somehow they only get between 28 and 37 months in prison. That, that's months, not years. It's also a very, very precise number, too. 37. Yeah, okay. yeah. 37 months. Asi ends up getting sentenced to 13 years in prison for running a criminal organization. Extortion, arson, unlawful imprisonment, and, and other financial crimes. Um, so we, you mentioned, mentioned earlier, or I mentioned earlier, about how the kind of dichotomy here, we, we don't have all that high a crime rate or public safety like you do in a lot of other places, but the means of crime are more extreme often than other places. So the shoulder fired missile is, is, is a fairly common, I mean, not all that common, but it's certainly not unprecedented. A number of dudes have tried to do this. It's, they've been used, you know, on, on a number of occasions to, uh, for, for gangland stuff. There was one back in 2012, I wrote about where these guys in Ashdod, the Megiddo brothers were going to try to kill Shalom Domrani and their whole idea, because he lives on some big villa out in this, uh, Moshav, this, rural community, let's call it, in the South, you can't really get up to his house and you don't want to. So they were going to drive a tractor to some distance from the house, stand in the scoop of the tractor, raise it up, or somebody was, stand in the scoop, raise it up, and then fire the missile, and hopefully hit him and not one of the members of his family. So that, um, you know, fortunately didn't, didn't go through. But these sorts of means are not, uh, are not rare here, certainly not uh, grenades. Grenades are, are quite common. Um, these things are, are easy to steal from the military, and that's one of the ways that the Israeli military can play a role in organized crime as being a, a good source of uh, ammunition and weaponry in a country where guns are strictly controlled, unlike the U.S. Meanwhile, Charlie, who's another brother, he's engaged in what the press calls the shawarma war, which was the Abu Bulls fighting with the Abergils over what I think was the, the shawarma racket, the, the grilled meat racket. Seriously, like the police shut down a bunch of Shawarma restaurants owned by the mobsters after Charlie and a few others got shot in front of one of the restaurants. Uh, and from what I understand, the Abu Bulls are mostly donezo these days, and, and I think most of them are in prison. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it, it sounds funny, but if you, the, the price of shawarma just keeps growing up. I mean, shawarma, <laughs> it is not a cheap lunch option anymore, you know? I mean, you're looking at 38 shekels just in a pita, so that's about, you know, $12 now for a sandwich and one is not going to fill you up. Yeah. I think, you know, not, that's a crime in itself. Well, hold on. Yes. A it is. But I think not all that long ago, it was about 18. It was 15 when I first came here for shawarma uh, in, a, in a pita and it just keeps going up. I think it's now it's, it's, it's well over 30 shekels. And so, yeah, if you can get in on that early, you're in good shape. Um, with, with the Abupals, they're one of those families that the, there's a uh, difference between how well they are known to the Israeli public and how actually powerful they are in that, in the underworld. And so there's somebody, there was one of those families that everybody knows and has heard of, and they've been on TV and all that stuff, but they, they faded a while back. Um, you know, after Felix died, that was kind of, that was, that was the beginning. And then of the end, and then Asi, again, the son, the heir, who's not really up to the same level of his dad, who was a self-made man. That's, that rings true in every one of these families pretty much. And then, um, Francois Boudboul was killed. And then, Another Francois Aboutboul, who was uh, the son of Charlie Aboutboul. It's hard to keep it straight. He was arrested for murdering a kid at a nightclub. Some kind of just innocent kid who, who 
got in an altercation and this this guy uh, murdered him. And that was a huge case here and just brought a, a ton of heat on the family. And then it was pretty much just Charlie Abut Bull running the show. And he uh, he took his own life a few years ago. And at that point, you know, I mean, they, they were already not able to really compete. You had a couple of Arab, Arab crime organizations moving in on, the, on that Natanya area and other guys. And it's just at some point, you know, your, your time's up. And that so that family kind of, uh, you know, their their star has faded, let's say. When it comes down to it, though, in my opinion, I think in a lot of others, there are two Israeli crime families that really rise above the rest. And that's the Abergils, who I mentioned a bunch, and the Rosenstein family. And I could do an entire episode just on the Abergils because Yitzhak, the leader, like I said, criminal prodigy, the likes of which I've rarely seen. He's the son of Moroccan immigrant parents, and he grows up the youngest of 10 siblings in the rough city of Lod and the projects in the 70s. And this is a lot from, from Ben's own reporting. His father was an alcoholic, and his mother worked a bunch of jobs that was never home. He had older brothers that were in and out of prison and addicted to drugs. This is a quote he told the court. I can remember that we were always lacking. If Abergil is to be believed, his gangsterdom started at literally three years old, because honestly, who remembers being three, when he started shoplifting and stealing food. He was allegedly hiding guns, drugs, and like grenades for dealers and gangsters when he was five or six years old. He said he would use shapes and stuff to identify whose guns was whose when he hid them. That was his system. At 12, he graduated to running a stash house selling hash and heroin with his brother. And at 14, he was smuggling drugs in the jail for one of his other brothers. 14 is also when he shot someone for the first time, a 33-year-old who wouldn't let him into like a rec center or something like that, some sort of teen party because he was wearing shorts. And look, I'm not condoning violence or saying bouncers sometimes deserve to get shot, but also sometimes bouncers deserve to get shot. Yeah, I think that you can make a, a case for that in some instances. I think it's, with this particular <laughs> case, it's, it's, to know this is very much an Israeli kind of underworld cliche. Somebody stabbed some guy at a club who didn't let him in. Bouncers get stabbed like that. I mean, it's happened fairly, you know, a, a good number of times. There's also a kind of, there may be arguably a racial component in that as well. Because, you know, when you come up to the club, they're going to look at how you look and how you dress and your skin. And they're going to look also, if they ask you for your ID, on that ID, they can see your last name and where you're from. And so by the name of that town and your last name, a lot of these bouncers are going to make a decision we're not to let you in. But that's, that's, I'm not saying that's not what happened here. I'm just saying when these things do happen. It, it happens. Right. Uh, by 16, he's running multiple trap houses and importing drugs in from the Netherlands. I mean, this is like LeBron James level type of talent right here. This kid is a prodigy. He's also illiterate, but we'll get to that later. He soon becomes a, a borer. Borer? How do you say it? Borer. Uh, borer. Yeah. It comes from the word to... Which, uh, to clear stuff up or to clarify, to make obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like the Israeli version of a Russian thief in law, the kind of high level respected criminal who oversees other criminal disputes. And then he kills somebody, a pimp that allegedly threatened him with a grenade. He's, I think, 17 at this time, by the way, 17, and he kills this guy. So during the trial, his oldest childhood friend, who was also engaged to his sister, betrays him and testifies against him. And according to Abergil, he never gets over that. He gets sentenced to 30 years, but ends up doing 12. But and Ben, my question is like, like 12 on 30. How does that, how does that happen? Right. So one, one thing in general about, about Israel, there, there tends to be um, not, not very serious sentences for, for crimes, um, especially compared to the states. You don't have this sort of thing where a guy gets busted for, for trafficking and he gets a life sentence or a guy does armed robbery with a, you know, and he gets 30 years, no chance of parole. You don't, you don't have that. A life sentence is 30 years. Um, and he, I think him getting out early was, was largely because he was 17. It was also because he, he went, when he was in jail, he was, he was famous already. He was famous on the street before he went into jail. He was famous in prison and he became kind of like a guy out of a movie who just sort of like ran the prison and had real criminals just kind of waiting on him as a young man, you know, still a teenager. And he was just a master manipulator. So he had, and it's one of the more bizarre stories. He he, he built up a friendship with the warden and he convinced the warden that, you know, he was, he was changing his ways, a kind of classic story. And he actually convinced the warden to take him to be on a TV show. Cause that's the other thing, not just bad, not just low sentences, Israeli criminals get a lot of furloughs, which I in general tend to be kind of in favor of, but either way, he on a furlough, they were, they were, they were, took him to be on this primetime TV talk show and you can find it on YouTube. It's him being interviewed about how he, 
has changed his ways, and now he's a student of philosophy. He even read a poem that he made, and then uh, not long after that, he gets released and becomes you know, the most feared criminal in the country. So I think it's a, it's a case of a guy being 17 when he did the crime, doing 12 years, which is pretty, pretty good for Israel, and then uh, just being able to manipulate his way out there. In prison, he stirs up, like Ben said, a whole ton of shit, stabs people, and he becomes his boss. And he also meets a guy called Shmaya Angel. Angel? Angel? How would yeah. you uh, say his last name? Angel. 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 Uh, yeah. oh, he's a much older first-generation Israeli gangster. He died at 51 of cancer in 2004. He was serving a life sentence from a situation in 1982 where he killed two of his drug trafficking partners. He was considered one of Israel's most dangerous prisoners, and once got a prisoner who was set to testify against his wife, stabbed 131 times, despite being held in a guarded cell. So Shemaya takes this guy under his wing and also teaches him how to read. And as Ben has reported, he's fond of, of Ayn Rand, right? Yes, Ayn Rand and Nietzsche. Also, um, Siddhartha by Herman Hess. I, I haven't read the, the book, but he, um, in, in his testimony in, in the big 512 case against them, he talked a lot about these books and, and Nietzsche, he said, uh, thus, thus spoke Zarathustra, <laughs> changed his life behind bars. Uh, I don't know if that's an indictment of Nietzsche or not, but he really said it uh, made a big difference in his life. And that's how he learned to read with these books. So I don't know if Ayn Rand gets any of the blame for this, but... Um, I think it definitely, it definitely does. Definitely. I, does. Does. I mean, Alice shrugged. Yeah. Uh, here's oh, a so quote typical. from, from you talk. You know, so yeah. typical. Of course, he's an Ayn Rand guy, you know. <laughs> Here's a quote from him. I was born into crime, grew up in crime, was breastfed crime, heard crime, did crimes. All of my life, I was in one giant bubble of crime. There was nothing else, nothing, a pit and nothing that was connected to normal life. I knew the world of crime, the laws, rules, grammar, but the normal world. And as you can see, Actually, you know, but the normal world with a question mark at the end of it. I phrased that wrong. But either way, as you can see, this guy, he loves doing crimes. And it's actually, it's, it's all he knows. You know, he was a product of his environment. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. I think definitely in the story he tells, which again, his life story got to take a little bit of grain of salt. But, but the story that he does tell and just the facts of being from a really large family with a ton of siblings, basically a one-parent household in Lod in the 70s in uh, Binyan Rakivit, like a boxcar building, they call them. Um, you, you, that's, that's a hard place now. That, that's a tough, that's a tough town now. So I can imagine what it was like in the seventies, how poor it was. I'm not saying a guy like that never had any other options, but I could understand why he, somebody like that would feel like they didn't and would feel like he didn't have a chance. And also if you combine that with his natural talent and charisma, you can see how, you know, he was destined for that sort of success. You can also imagine, like I'm sure you've said in other podcasts, this, this type of guy like this, if he had been, if he had grown up in a different family in a different neighborhood, he could have been, you know, could have been a doctor, a lawyer. He could have been a politician, but um, Fortune 500 CEO. You know, like you know, his lawyer said he was extremely charismatic and all that. Yeah. But he ends up getting released from prison. I guess he's twenty nine, thirty, and he just gets right back into it. He's importing drugs on a global level, killing people on three continents. You know, the usual. He once described going into the underground casino business, and when asked what he brought to the table as a business partner, he answered, "I bring with me thirteen years in prison. I bring with me Yitzhak Abergil." In other places, if you lose money, you don't pay. Okay. But when I'm a partner in the business, there was no such thing as not paying. So, you know, that sounds like the kind of person you want to be in business with, maybe if he's on your side. Definitely. Ben quotes a source in one of his articles as saying, until Yitzhak Abergil, we didn't know about feuds between criminal organizations. We had local feuds, local fights between gangs, not organizations. Israel's anti-organized crime law was put in place in June 2003 because of him. He was in charge in Israel, and also in Thailand, Spain, Belgium, and the USA. This is not something that we've known before, and it's not something that has come back since. And you have another source saying, he's the most superior, high-ranking criminal that has ever existed in Israel. In his personal capabilities, his personality, his disturbed, psychopathic approach to life, and his intelligence and charisma, he is the most dangerous criminal that there has ever been here. Look, it's, I, I, would, I would tend to agree with, with most of that. But... One of the guys saying some of this stuff was involved in the state's prosecution, so maybe he has some sort of interest or he could be prone to kind of exaggerate a little bit. But there, there is something to that. I mean, they had, you certainly had feuds in Israel and murders between gangsters and, and criminals way back in the 70s, 80s, even before. And they were highly publicized. People knew about them. They made the news and people got killed in the broad daylight and all that. But this was more gang-style feuds and crews on the street. It wasn't 
Israeli dudes having guys killed in Prague because of beef back in Israel or moving cocaine from Brazil to Montreal and ecstasy from Holland to LA and murdering people in the States, Latin America, Europe, Africa, that type of thing you, you didn't really have. In addition, obviously also to the technological stuff they have now that, the the type of means they have at their disposal to, to kill people and track people and all that is, is, is quite good. So that wasn't there before. Um, and, and he's, he's kind of the, he's the guy who kind of built that and inspired that. And he had the, I guess you say he had the vision to be a, uh, you know, to be a ground, you know, groundbreaker in that sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, him, the, the DEA, along him and Zev Rosenstein, they called them the Escobars of Israel. And it said that he was once, at one point, one of the top 40 drug traffickers into the U.S., which means he's competing with, like, all the Mexican and Colombian cartels, Dominican importers, things like that. His organization trafficked ecstasy, cocaine, hashish, and other drugs around the world, from the U.S. to Belgium to Japan moving between Morocco, Spain, Belgium, and the U.S. itself. He and his brothers, I think there were three others that were actively involved, have been arrested and detained in multiple countries. I think they're still waiting on a five-year sentence for him in, in, in Belgium. And they're just truly this epic crime family. And they really are something out of a plot line, like I said, in Grand Theft Auto. And I think we see that most when they team up with the Violin Boys, that's with a Z, a Latino street gang in L.A. that was sick of being pushed around by the Mexican mafia, La M.A., who you know, control Southern Los Angeles, or Southern California, I'm sorry, telling them what to do. You see, the Abergils had all this ecstasy, apparently even owning manufacturing labs in Belgium, but they needed help with distribution and protection in LA. I mean, sure, they're powerful, but it's not that they have a bunch of gang members and street dealers in the US. So this happens in 2000, they strike up a deal with the violent boys. The feds start to catch on shortly after though, because these guys start making way too much noise. In July of 2002, they bust a big ecstasy deal in action involving three groups of people, including some big Israeli players and their bodyguards who are carrying automatic weapons. Now, the big player in the U.S. for the Abergils is this guy Moshe Malul. He's, he's their man in L.A. And another guy by the name of Sammy Atlas was there too. He was in their ring. Sammy, though, he's not exactly the most loyal, gets a little too smart, tries to steal a shipment of pills and sell it on his own. Moshe and his brother, they catch on to this. They fly to Spain to meet with the Abergils who decide that Sammy has to die. Then the Violent Boys, they catch them in a cafe in California, in, in Encino of all places, and they kill him in the parking lot. Unfortunately, one of the Violent Boys also kills a cop in 2003, and you know that puts you on the radar. By 2005, 1,300 law enforcement officers are involved in a huge sweep to shut them down. Like, don't, don't kill a police officer in the US. Like, I've seen it with the NYPD. I've, I've been on the scene shortly after it happens when someone shoots a cop, and they react like an army, like nothing else. You know, they will send the choppers, they will flood with officers way more than they need to try to set something happen. So that's, that's kind of what happens there. And uh, it's, again, it, it, it'll put you on the radar in a way you don't want to be. It's important to point out too, that the Abergils weren't just street thugs and drug dealers. Like they were actually quite smart and sophisticated. They ran a huge money laundering and embezzling operation, stealing tens of million dollars from an Israeli bank. And I also kind of wonder like, what, you know, who, who does the paperwork for these guys? Because I don't, I don't think they're the ones doing it. So they had, uh, with that, that was one of the bigger, uh, that, that was such a huge story in Israel in terms of kind of, kind of a, a turning point in, in organized crime and just in terms of the massive amount of money that it put out there that was able to seed all types of things. I, the, the estimate I, I've read or heard was somewhere between 250 to 300 million shekels, which comes out to about, you know, it's about 3.2 shekels of the dollar now. So it's about 70, $80 million dollars. And, and, Jesus. and this was, uh, so they had, it was because of two main inside guys. They had a guy named Ofer Maximov who owed a lot of money to the mob and his sister worked for the bank as their head of investment or deputy head of investment. So she was, she was pretty high ranking in there. So she was able to em embezzle all this money for her brother. And, uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't end well for her. She ended up going to prison, but yeah, they definitely had a guy on the inside and they, they exploited her as much as they possibly could. Look, I'm not going to get too far into it because financial crimes are, for the most part, boring and I barely understand it. But it seems like from this summary from the Times of Israel, they, uh, you know, they had these plans where they would push out loans to Israeli business people in the U.S. who were then extorted, so they had to give up their businesses uh, and just, you know, that that sort of stuff, embezzlement, whatever. It's boring, but but you get it. So unfortunately, though, the Abergils were about to learn a lesson that many organized criminal has learned before, which is shit is different when you start fucking with the U.S. 
especially when you're doing so from a country that's an ally, because the Abrazils, with the help of the Israeli government, were going to be put on trial in the U.S. Yitzhak Abrazil and his brother, Mayer, they end up getting arrested in Israel in 2008. But we've kind of already covered how the Israeli criminal justice system is sort of inept and how these guys were wild enough to go after all the prosecutors and judges and whatnot. We should also mention that there was another killing of a civilian in 2008 that shocked the country right around when this happened, which was a woman who was a social worker was killed in front of her kids and husband in an assassination attempt gone, ra- gone wrong that led to another sort of coming to God moment for the country. So that's, you know, they were fed up with this stuff. Yeah, that was a huge, that was a huge stage. Her name was uh, Margarita Loughton. It was on the, it was on the beach in Batyam. The place, just tons of people, families, all that all around. And that was one of those ones like you can't, you can't really ignore that. The Israelis figure it's better for these guys to go on trial in the U.S., face the U.S. justice system, and then get sent back to serve out the remainder of the time in Israel due to some legal stature that, frankly, I'm not going to bother to learn the specifications of. Here's the Organized Crime and Corruption reporting project on it. Why try Abergeel and other foreign drug dealers in the U.S.? The answer is simple in the Abergeel case. RICO and other U.S. legal provisions are tougher than any law Israel has to offer. Retired, elise, retired Israeli police commander Yaakov Borovsky speaking to the Jerusalem Post in July after a botched mob hit left a young mother dead, said police were hamstrung by Israel's current three strikes law, which stipulates that a file is not flagged with a suspect's connection to the crime family until his third offense. The Abergeels are arrested in 08. They're sent to the U.S. in 11, 2011, convicted, and then sent back to Israel to serve out the rest of their time for this particular crime spree in 2014. The Abergeels, though, they weren't the first Israeli mafioso to go through that process of extradition and trial in the U.S. That honor belongs to Zev, the wolf of seven lives, Rosenstein, who, if you remember, survived that bombing in 2003 and fought a vicious war with the Abergeels after they tried to expand into his gambling empire. The Abergeels actually met with a bunch of other crime families in Brussels in 2003 to discuss how to take out Rosenstein shortly before the bombing. One thing about the bombing, too, and why it was such a big deal, as, as, you know, as Ben talked about, this is Israel, right? They have their federal government uh, back then focused on the Intifada, their suicide bombings, terrorist attacks, Hamas, all that all over. So to see, you know, an Israeli doing this during that time, people were pissed off. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, I remember being here at the time and it was, you know, a, a bomb blast in the middle of the day in Tel Aviv. Obviously, you're going to assume the worst. Um, and then it quickly emerged that it wasn't. Uh, terror attack and then it became this sort of thing it's like we got all this other things to worry about and we got to worry about getting blown up by a Jew in the middle of the day randomly with no morning so it's like you know, we didn't have enough problems right now it's like in the middle of a pandemic now you got oh by the way now there's bird flu well, it's like well, we had this we were doing with COVID man. Anyway, you know what I'm saying so it was like another thing on top of that and it was a similar kind of dynamic in 2013 you had this 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 under, underworld war with, with Shalom Domani and Benny Shlomo and, and Ashkelon and Ashkelon is in southern Israel, near near Gaza, and so th- what they usually deal with in terms of explosions is rockets from Gaza when that happens. And then when they started having these car bombs there, the first couple of times they go off, people assume it's a rocket, or the first time at least. And so it was the same type of dynamic. It's like, wait, we don't have enough problem dealing with these rockets and those sirens and those explosions and that trauma and that PTSD. Now these knuckleheads are going to be blown up each other in our neighborhood as well. Like, don't we have enough to deal with? So that that dynamic really pissed people off. And it got a lot more attention on these guys than they would have had otherwise. So not all that smart. Zev is the son of Romanian Jewish immigrants. He's born in Jaffa, which is just south of Tel Aviv. He dropped out of high school, starts working at an electronics store, which is just kind of, you know, quintessential Israeli. Sony guts and all that. That was the, that was the Sabra Price is right. I, I'm always happy when I've, when I've met someone or spoke to someone who's actually seen that skit. I, it was... <laughs> It was so dumb, but it was classic. It was it was accurate in uh, like a very specific way, like like the Zohan was completely ridiculous, but also yeah. it hit on something. And uh, it's hard. To... <laughs> so he's he starts off during that time as a petty thief. Soon got involved with running gambling rackets and illegal legal casinos near the old bus station neighborhood in Tel Aviv, which is actually a really interesting sort of hardcore rundown area, or at least it was when I spent some time there. I had tried to make a documentary about African refugees in Israel back in 2008. And this whole area, it's, it's a really tough, tough neighborhood, but kind of cool. What's that long street that's over there? Uh, it's called Nevis Shanun, which is also the, the name of the neighborhood. It's, uh, I would say it's one of the, you know, it's got some problems and whatnot, but it's, it's easily one of the most interesting and unique places in Israel and definitely worth checking out. Yeah, it's, it's full of restaurants and bars run by all the immigrants in Israel. So you have Filipinos, Chinese, Eritrean, Sudanese, um, you know, all, all their shops, some Israeli Arabs, tattooed Russian gangsters sitting out drinking beers. But yeah, it's 
also, you know, it's super shady and, and full of drugs and, and prostitution, or at least it was back then. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's definitely it's definitely a seedy place, and it's got got a lot of issues, and it's um, you know, but 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 you're also safe there, you know, to walk around and take it in. You know, it's not like a lot of other places in the world. Yeah, no, it's cool. I, I like it. Rosenstein comes to prominence in 1993 when he allegedly took out a big time 70s and 80s gangster Yehez- Yehezikel Yehez- Aslan, who was in his. Yehezikel. Say again? Uh, Yehez- Yehezikel Yehezikel. Aslan. Or Hezi. I'm not even going to try. No, no, you did. I anyway. Think you, did good. <laughs> you were in the ballpark. He's yeah. in Iraq. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting close. He's an Iraqi Jewish godfather whose face was deformed because he was shot nine times in a previous assassination attempt. What is with these guys? Like, what do they put in the water there? These guys just survive all that stuff. So it could be bad aim, you know, like, I mean, yeah, maybe that's user error. You know, it's not just, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, he, crazy. but yeah, he ends up in mesh in a war with the Abergils and a bunch of the others and all that. Honestly, at this point, it's hard to keep track. Everyone went to war with everyone. Let's just, let's just say that even some of the guys we haven't covered. And in 2001, Rosenstein orders the murder of a competitor and a guy in a motorcycle guns down three people outside a beach club. The Abergils at one point, they think Rosenstein conspired with the Abu Bulls and another family to have their brother, Yaakov, killed in 2002. Remember, Felix gets gunned down outside the casino in, in, in Czech Republic in 2002. But yeah, that's what leads up to the bomb attempt in 2003 that kills three civilians and shocks the country. But that bomb attempt, it misses him in 2003. Unfortunately for him, he can't avoid the U.S. criminal justice system and he's busted in 2005 in Israel. He was, he was injured, though. He did get lightly injured in that, uh, in the blast, and then drove himself to the hospital. If you remember, like, like Cameron, when he was robbed in, in Harlem, and he drove to the hospital in the Lamborghini on the, for, the, for the New York listeners. But, he, um, but other than that, I mean, again, he unscathed, and three other people who weren't involved uh, did get killed. So that's how, that's how Big it, deal. Yeah, definitely. Big deal. When he's busted, it's said that the Israeli mobsters control 80% of the world's ecstasy market. And if you were hitting the clubs in like early 2000s, shout out to Sound Factory, you would realize that is a lot of money. At one point, a bust of Rosenstein's people turns up 700,000 pills in one apartment in Manhattan in 2001. According to Douglas Century, quote, the new Israeli ex sea kingpins had a unique advantage over competing global mafiosos. They owned the underground drug labs in the Netherlands and Belgium and already had an infrastructure in place, often using strippers and ultra-Orthodox Jewish teenagers as drug mules on flights to New York and Los Angeles. To give you a level of how high up the Israelis were in, in this trade, one Israeli gangster supplied to another, who supplied to another, who then supplied to another, who happened to be the guy who supplied Sammy the Bull Gravano's ecstasy ring. He was running out in, in like Arizona, I think, when he was supposed to be in witness protection. The Israelis also apparently supplied it to the guys who controlled the trade in limelight, which if you've ever heard about Peter Gation, Chris Paciello, Michael Alec, Clumland, all that good stuff is a really fascinating story, but also kind of like maybe like the global ground zero for ecstasy in New York, in, in the States, maybe in the world at that time. But yeah, the Israeli police, they'd failed to get Zev locked up for years. So they took him in 2005 with the help of U.S. law enforcement for smuggling drugs into the U.S. Says the LA Times, in the 2006 prosecution of former ecstasy drug king- kingpin Zev Rosenstein in a precedent-setting arrangement, he was charged in America, arrested in Israel, and extradited, sentenced to 12 years in prison, then shipped back to Israel to serve his time. And the Ford in 2008 wrote, the current moves by Israeli authorities stem from an amendment to Israeli law in 1999 that allowed the country to extradite citizens who reside in the country on the condition that they serve their prison sentences in Israel. The Israeli government had previously adopted a law in 1978, barring the extradition of its criminals because of what then Prime Minister Menachem Begin described as a fear that the prosecution of Israeli criminals abroad would be tainted by anti-Semitism abroad. I mean, I... I I guess I could see that. Um, I think for sure, <laughs> for sure, definitely. I mean, depending on where they are arrested, certainly. Um, but I think just just from the standpoint of the criminals themselves or the suspects, it's much better to do <laughs> uh, to do that time in Israel. Um, you know, Israeli prisons are are, are pretty filthy and, and crowded and loud and don't smell good. And you know, they they got some really rough guys in there too. But but it's a lot safer than being in a penitentiary in the states. It, the conditions are better in terms of all those, you know, anything from from solitary to to everything else. I mean, even murderers can get furloughs, regular furloughs in Israel. Um, you can get conjugal visits quite easily. All these things are are much easier than they are in the American penitentiary system. And also for somebody like Abajel or like Rosenstein, here they know who you are. Here your name actually has some weight. If you're in a federal prison in Colorado, nobody's gonna know who you are or care. 
and or they might find out who you are, but you're not really going to be a guy whose name strikes a lot of fear into their hearts. So for these guys, uh, it's definitely in their interest to do their time here, near their families, and near um, where their fellow convicts will fear them. Also, you got to imagine if you're an Israeli prisoner in an American federal prison, like, you know, the whole Aryan Nation guys and the black nationalist guys, they're not going to be like a big fan of you. You know, it's probably, it's probably tough. I actually met a, a Colombian, no, he's a Venezuelan cartel guy who was Jewish and wearing a yarmulke in lockup in DC. Interesting. Uh, he was like a high level Venezuelan cartel guy affiliated with the government. And uh, he was like, yeah, people aren't, he, his English wasn't great, so we couldn't communicate that much. We exchanged letters for a while, but he was just like, yeah, people aren't, they're not so fond of me in here. <laughs> and this was a dude who was like, you know, trained in the art of, of, of defending himself and murdering people. Well, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's great wor- that he, working, you know, is, is big. Oh, he definitely found God, definitely found God in prison. Uh, but he was not, um, yeah, he, you know, these are, this is one of the most powerful cartels in the world. Uh, but he was just like, yeah, it's not, it's not the best place to be right yeah, now. It's going to be hard to find. But, uh, I mean, I, I remember being the only Jewish kid in school, you know, it's, it's tough. So, uh, yeah, but I think if anything, I, that's good that he's becoming more observant. That could help him, you know, <laughs> just to kind of, you know, pass the time, if anything, and also get his life back together. But yeah, I assume, you know, it, like it, so many things in the penitentiary, it's going to be more strength in numbers. And if you're, you know, if you're well known here, that's better for you than if you're just a nobody there. Yeah, and just to give an example of how, how tough it was to try these guys, in 2004 in Israel, there was a judge who was killed, I think, right outside his home, and that was right before Zev got locked up. Yeah, it was, uh, that, was a big, that was a big case back in, in, uh, was in 2004. You know, Mata is quite a nice area in Israel, a fancy, fancy town. Um, a judge named Adi Azar, he was, he was gunned down in his car in the driveway. I don't quite remember the, the exact motives for it, but there was, it was a couple of pretty bad dudes who did it. And that was uh, one of these very shocking cases, obviously, when something like this happens. I mean, you know, it's not every day a judge gets killed, obviously. So, yeah, a bunch of these families, they've been prosecuted, they've been broken up, killed, all that. And there are some other upstarts we're actually going to get into in the bonus episode for Patreon subscribers. But to end things, we have to mention case 512, which started in 2017. And if I'm not mistaken, is apparently still going on. It's the biggest case ever in Israel and involves the prosecutions of a bunch of the mobsters we talked about, including the Abergils and crimes just going back decades. Here's Ben actually summing it up in one of his articles. Case 512 also covers two murders in Israel and Germany, two attempted murders in Japan and the Czech Republic, and the manifold crimes associated with running a global drug trafficking, money laundering, and tax evasion network. As the investigation weaved its way around the globe over the course of 15 years, it took on a life of its own eventually ensnaring more than half a dozen Israeli mob bosses from several different and rival crime gangs. Indicted with Abergil were, amongst others, his brother Mayor, Moti Hassin, his former right-hand man, Avi Ruhan, a major crime boss operating out of Renana, and Netanya mob bosses Asi Abutbul and Rico Shirazi, rivals of each other, and in Abutbul's case, of Abergil as well. And I think at, at one point, Rosenstein was actually called to testify against the Abergils, who remember I've tried to kill him multiple times and he actually refused to talk. So there you go. A little nice, little, nice little code of signs still being honored over there yeah. in Israel. But you, you've covered this case extensively. Yeah, quite a bit. It was, um, well, with, with Zev in, in his case, you know, I, I don't see any interest he could have had in, in testifying. He's, he's going to be re- released pretty soon. I don't know what they would have got him. And I think if he wants to settle that with, with the Bargel and his guys, he's not going to do it by, by testifying against them. It was, I would say, one of the crazy things about the case is just the way that it was, it wasn't just that it was, you know, taken down this organization. It was, it, it scooped up all types of guys who were in all different organizations and all don't like each other. A lot of them, you know, a lot of these guys were rivals and they all just, it's just this case that just sprawled and sprawled and it had seven different state witnesses who were all very involved guys and not very good guys. So it is definitely, I would say that's not, you know, that's not an exaggeration. It, it would be the largest criminal investigation in Israel's history that did not involve Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Like, <laughs> other, than, other than the cases, the four uh, investigations and, and counting, you know, outside the investigations against Prime Minister Netanyahu and his indictments and those against former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, who did some time in prison, this would be, this would be the largest one, certainly in the organized crime world. Just the scope of it, the resources they invested in, the names, all of these guys are big names a lot of our names to people who are everyday people who don't cover this as journalists or don't or don't live in that world like a barger like like the booples like all these guys 
And then there's a bunch of other dudes who aren't household names but are very are real heavy guys, and it just scooped up a ton of them. Now, how many of them are actually going to get convicted and do any serious time is a, is a whole other thing, but it's definitely been a big one, and um, it, it's still ongoing. Obviously, COVID and uh, the, the, the pandemic has kind of screwed up the court system a little bit, but, you know, it, it'll wrap up pretty soon. So yeah, there's 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 a lot we actually didn't get to. A few more minor players, ridiculous stories, including something called the affair of the avenging police, which is straight out of like a Bruce Willis straight to streaming movie. Basically, a bunch of officers in a particular town felt like they were being left out to dry by their high command when facing down this mobster Michael Moore and his organization. So they took matters into their own hands and and you know put a pipe bomb under his car and threw a grenade at his house and the whole thing backfired. They got arrested. We'll get into it. Patreon episode. Uh, patreon.com slash the underworld podcast thank you so much to everyone who's been subscribing um we really appreciate it so we can keep doing this i want to thank ben a ton for his excellent reporting and for being a guest and everyone who has signed up for the patreon going on like i said we're going to get into more of this there was just so many names that for the first time ever we're not just doing an interview bonus episode we're going to tell a story in there uh it's definitely worth your time throw us some cash make it happen underworld podcast thank you so much Ben, what's your what's your uh, your organization again that you're working for right now? Yeah, so I write at kanigma.com, C-A-N-N-I-G-M-A.com. We also have a podcast, the Cannabis Enigma Podcast. Check us out. We cover the whole world of weed. So come check us out, kanigma.com. Thanks, guys.